Hey everybody, and welcome back to the Dungeon Dive. Sorry I've been away for a while, I was on a little vacation, and so, but now I'm back, and we're going to be starting our playthrough of Darklight Memento Mori. Now, I'm going to be playing this with only one character, and I'm going to be playing as the Exorcist. And that's because I really like uh, Paladin and faith-based characters I mentioned in the uh, unboxing. And I'm excited for this because this game actually does scale down to playing with only one hero. Um, a lot of solo games will let you play solo, but you always usually have to play with more than one hero, more than one character. And you kind of have to juggle things. So in this game, they say that it scales perfectly well with playing as one hero. So we're going to try that. I don't know if this is going to be a good hero to play with. Um, solo. I'm not sure how well he'll stand up, but we're going to see what happens. All right, so here's his mini. Unpainted, of course. And then here is his character sheet. So we will go over this for a moment here. Okay, so he has a melee. He, can, has, he has one melee attack, and he hits on a three up. He can hold four consumables in his belt. He has one ranged attack, and he hits on a four up. Okay, he's an exorcist. His class actually is a demonologist. So the exorcist is kind of his name. I'm not gonna name him yet until he levels up. I'm gonna play Warhammer Quest rules. Okay, he has initiative of five, which I've played through this game once, and the highest initiative I've seen is eight. So five is, five is up there. He has a movement of four. He can take uh, 10 hits before he dies. He has five sanity. <clears throat> and then he starts with a demon femur, the Libro Sanctum, an old sensor, and one consumable. So here are his three starting items. Okay. We have the sensor, which this is a belt item, but it doesn't count against his total. So he can still hold four consumables. The old sensor never counts for a total in... Um, on his belt. However, it does count towards the uh, weight, the encumbrance. So this weighs one. In this game, you can hold 10 plus three weight and items, and his strength is three. So I can hold 13 pounds worth of items, basically. Okay, so this is an old sensor. Um, this gives me plus one armor for myself and all allies adjacent to me when suffering attacks from demons. Now, I think almost every enemy in this base game is a demon. We'll see if that holds true. And this is his starting weapon, a femur. It's a melee weapon, it's a mace, and it's a bone. And it's one-handed, I can sell it for two in town, and it does 1d6 plus one damage plus my strength, which is three. Okay, and then finally, my last item is the Libro Sanctum. So this is my book of miracles, basically. Um, this does not have to be equipped, and so I can just keep it on my character, and this holds the miracles that I take into each dungeon. At the start of each dungeon, take three miracles at random, one from each category, healing, offensive, and defensive. So we're going to take the miracles. I'm going to shuffle these up. Okay, we're going to choose our defensive. I'm going to take the healing miracles. Okay, shuffle those up. Take that one. And then I'm going to shuffle up the offensive and take that one. Now let's see what we start with. Hopefully something good. Because I have a feeling that the selection of miracles really could make or break this character running solo. So for offense, we have it costs three points to use, three points of faith. We have control evil. Choose one demon in line of sight and make them immediately deal one ranged or one melee attack against a character in range. Okay, when anything says character, what that means is either a, a hero, which are called the accursed, or a monster. So a character is basically any model. Okay, cannot be cast if the demon does not have rules for melee or ranged attacks. Okay. 
Not quite sure I'm into that one, but let's see. So now we have retribution. Apply this to a demon in line of sight. If the demon dies before the start of your next turn, it will heal all accursed in line of sight by 1d6. Okay, so I can cast this on something that's about to die. It costs four, and when it dies, it'll heal me. And then finally, our defensive. Hold evil. One demon in line of sight will be unable to move on their upcoming turn. They will also, this will also grant a plus one to hit to their attackers until the start of your next turn. Only one demon can be held at a time. All right, I don't know. I don't know if I'm thrilled about those, but we'll see. So I'm just going to stack those on top of my book. And then over here, we have our equipment list. And this shows us our wounds, um, our stamina. So we start with three stamina. We start with the amount of stamina equal to our endurance. And stamina can be used for different things, basically for um, rolling out of the way, Dark Souls style, or evading damage. Okay, we start with our sensor, goes into our belt slot. And again, it doesn't take up one of the uh, four slots. And our femur goes into one of our hand slots. So we'll put that into his left hand there. The spells, we're just going to put on top of his card. And now let's see what else we have here. Um, special rules. Okay. Uh, grant or gain one faith point token whenever the darkness roll is between one and four. I can only hold two faith points for each charisma point. Can equip one sensor on the belt. Does not take a consumable space. So as we play through the game and as we roll for darkness, I will gain faith tokens and I can hold a maximum of, what was it, two for each point of charisma. So I can hold a maximum of eight points of, of faith. So we're going to take four faith tokens and put those aside. These are worth one point on one side and two points on another. Okay, and morals. Your beliefs will not allow you to take options showing the skull icon beside them. Likewise, if the option has the holy symbol, you must take it. I can never learn spells and I cannot equip or consume items with the keyword cursed. So he needs to play as holy, as a holy character. And as I gain faith, I'm going to put them here on this faith bar and then I can use them to cast my miracles, blessings and whatnot. Okay, then next to this, we're going to have just a round selection card, something that helps you uh, keep track of the things that are going on. Then over here, we have our darkness wheel. The darkness wheel is kind of a, it's not really a timer, but it is a, um, it controls kind of the flow of the game. As things progress, things get more deadly and dangerous. Okay, then we have our treasure tokens here. Now these, whenever a treasure chest is found, we draw one of these at random and it tells us what is in it. Either rare loot, regular loot, um, it can be locked, in which case we have to use a lock pick to unopen it, or it can be a mimic, in which case we are attacked. So those have been mixed up and I will set those aside. Now we're gonna just shuffle up our regular decks of cards. So we have all the decks of cards that we're gonna need right here. So the decks that get shuffled are the encounter deck, Get that a quick shuffle. Okay. The event deck. The environment deck. The loot deck. Okay, the rare loot deck. These cards, the loot cards, the ones included in the expansion are slightly different size. So they don't shuffle all that well, but that's okay. 
All right. And then we have our, let's see, we're gonna build our dungeon deck. So the uh, quest we're gonna do is the first quest, which takes place in the Necro Stream quest room. Okay, the area highlighted in red marks the bridge squares. If an accursed moves over these squares by more than one each turn, they must make an agility one test. If they fall, if they fail, they will fall and die permanently. If they succeed, they may continue. All right. Now this quest calls for us to make our quest deck like this. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. So we have four random cards that I've drawn from the um, dungeon deck. We take our quest room. We put this over here. Okay, we shuffle this up. That goes on the bottom. We shuffle this up, that goes on top. So now our quest room is somewhere down in the bottom four cards. And then we're going to place this by the first door. Now I know usually the stairs down is considered the first tile, but I like this as stairs up. And you'll see why when we read the introduction. We place our hero there. Now the table I have is not very big. And so we're gonna have to get a little bit creative with how we build our dungeon to make sure um, everything fits. And now, I almost forgot one thing, is we need to take out our skill cards and choose our opening, our, our, um, our starting skill. So I believe there are four level one skills and you get to choose one of those to start the game with. So. Let's see what we have here. Okay, Devoted. At the start of the round, you will always receive one faith point, even if the darkness roll is five or six. I like that. Path of Justice. Whenever you kill a demon, gain two faith points. Flagellant. Whenever, once per turn, you may self-inflict two wounds to gain two faith points. And the good book. Reinforce your Libro Sanctum with metal plates and attach it to this to a sturdy chain, turning it into a melee weapon. You can equip in a hand slot. If used in dual wield attacks, you will not suffer the minus one to hit. That is awesome. Using your uh, your holy book <laughs> as a melee weapon. But I think I'm going to go ahead and take the devoted so I can constantly build up faith. I think that's going to be a... Um, I think that's gonna be good. So we will see about that. We'll see if that works. And then we have our Cursed Heart. So this is like the lantern in Shadows of Brimstone or Warhammer Quest. This is what illuminates our way. And this is what we as the accursed are kind of tied to, okay? So by holding the Cursed Heart, you become the group leader and must roll for darkness at the start of each round. Upon death, the heart automatically uh, given to the next willing accursed. Heal at any time, and this is important, this really is at any time during the round, you may either heal all accursed by a number of wounds equal to the current darkness roll or resurrect one accursed. Now I cannot resurrect myself using this because as soon as I'm dead, it no longer works for me or I can't use it, okay? So I'm gonna have to be vigilant in making sure that I'm using this to heal. And with one accursed, you get six charges. And those charges are over here. And they're charged up now, and when I use them, I will flip them over. All right, so let's see. <clears throat> we have our boards, we have our chits, we have our enemy tokens, our bags of enemies. I haven't yet gotten a um, a book to you or a uh, box to use yet. Turn down this light a little bit. There we go. Okay. Well, I think we should get started. Um, hope probably do a couple turns before my time runs out today. I'm going to try to keep these playthroughs to uh, thirty minutes. So this is the awakening. This is the um, the introductory quest. Naked, cold, and totally disoriented, you will awaken in a damp and dark cell. 
All memories of any past life have long since dissolved and evaporated from your consciousness. A click sounds in the darkness, the unlocking of your cell door. As it shutters open, the screams of rusty hinges blast in your ears. The blinding glow of the light outside causes you to throw up both hands to protect your sensitive eyes as they adjust to the onslaught of new visions. In the doorway stands a figure, huge, winged, wrapped loosely in the black linens of the type one might use to prepare a body for burial. This is the cursed heart, speaks the figure, in a voice that makes muscles ache and threatens to turn bone to ashes. A heart-shaped flask is held out in his hand. Hmm, the Estes flask, maybe. Feed it the souls of those you have slain, and it will grant you knowledge and power unknown. Stray too far, and it will destroy you. The, flat the flask calls out, and you feel an incredible craving to reach out and hold it. As your fingers close around the warm glass of the cursed heart, it begins to glow. Countless lives as passed through the turbulent power it houses. It whispers of its master, your black bandaged savior, the Grim Warden. With no further words, the Grim Warden vanishes. You still your stuttering nerves by taking up abandoned items from nearby for protection before stealing yourself for leaving this place. So the dungeon deck we've set up according to these rules. We've removed the encounter cards from the expansion for this scenario. We cannot escape this dungeon, so we cannot leave. We have to go through, either we live or we die. And we have to find the Necrostream quest room and then resolve the effects as follows. We have to spawn encounter card um, boss 11. So let me find that here. I thought I had pulled that out, but maybe I did not. Where is boss card 11? Here we go, sorry about that. So with one hero, we will be fighting one deviant and one devourer. Oh, that's encounter cards. Sorry, wrong one. That's why, I, let me mix those up again. I was gonna say, that seems, <laughs> that seems like a really easy final room. All right, so the boss cards, here we go. Number 11 should be on the back, yep. So when we find the quest room, we are going to be fighting one Dreadworm and two Deviants, okay? Um, any remaining monsters must be uh, spawned between the bridge and the archway. So this is where we place, this is how we set up. So basically we have to get to the quest room and we have to kill all the monsters in the dungeon to win. And each of Curse gains 1d6 times 5 souls, demon souls for that. So that is the setup. Uh, as you can see, pretty clear why I uh, think this game is so influenced by Dark Souls. Um, yeah. All right. So the first thing we do on a round is we take the darkness die. And we roll the darkness die. And we want to roll anything but a one. All right. So there's a three. Okay. If we roll a one, this ticks... It also ticks up every time we explore a new locate, a new tile. So there's our darkness. Now, special rules. I gain one faith point whenever the darkness rolls between one and four. So I just gained three faith points. So I'm going to put three faith points on my item bar there so I can use those to cast spells. The next thing is exploration. Now this only happens if there are any open doors or an unexplored archway. If there are no unexplored archways, we skip that phase. Now we do events. If there are any face down event cards, we have to encounter those. There are none. And now we are able to trade and exchange equipment between a cursed. We're only playing one hero, so we will always um, skip that phase. I guess in like, unless we need to change equipment. And now our actual turn starts. So what we can do in our turn is we have a move phase and an attack phase. Um, you can do those in any order. You can attack then move or move and then attack. You can also give up your movement entirely to recharge one use of your stamina. And then you can also give up your attack action to search. And we will go over that in a bit.
So the first thing, and you could, or you can give me an attack action for another movement action. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to move. So my movement is four. So I've got one, two, cost one to open a door, three, and four. Now I can't do anything else because I haven't explored yet. So that is going to be the end of this turn. So now we're back up top, roll that darkness die again, and another three. Oh, you know what? I should have only gained one faith point. I gained, um, gained one faith point whenever the darkness roll is between one and four. You don't gain one for each roll. So I now have two faith points. So that was a darkness roll. Now we are at the exploration phase. So we're gonna take our dungeon deck here and let's see what's in store for us. An L corridor. All right, let me find our first L corridor here. So I'm gonna place that off in that direction. Put an archway at the end and a door at the end. Okay, so. There we go, we're moving along. And now we take our dungeon deck and we put that behind the next door. So that was the exploration phase. Now what we do is also we move the darkness marker one step ahead, okay? So it goes into a blank spot, so nothing bad is gonna happen yet. All right, so now it is trading and exchange equipment, and now our turn starts. So now I can take my full movement of four. One, two, three, four. Facing is free. And then I'm going to forego my attack phase. I'm gonna take another movement phase. I'm gonna go one, two, open the door for three. It costs one point of movement to open a door. Okay, so that's basically it for that turn. Next turn, we're going to roll the darkness die. Another three, so I get another point of faith. I'm up to three points of faith. The darkness track does not move, but now we have exploration. We have one unexplored archway so let's see what we're getting into a long corridor this is uh, very reminiscent of Warhammer Quest right where you can just wander and wander, <laughs> wander and wander and wander all right so we're gonna have, have this come off this way we will put our archway over here And our door like that. And there is our new corridor. Okay, so that was exploration. We're gonna move the darkness one. Okay, so now we've hit a, um, a red darkness space. So now what we do is we have to roll a die. If we roll a one, two, or three, we draw an encounter. If we roll a four, five, or six, we draw an event. And it was a four. So we draw an event. And the event will go in the, um, it, because the darkness um, was triggered when we added a new tile, that event goes into that tile. So we take an event card and we're just gonna place it, place it face down underneath that tile. All right, so now our turn start. So I can go, let's see here. One, two, three, four, and then one, two, three, and four, we will open the door. Okay. So far, so good. We're at the darkness phase. Let's roll this dice here. A six. All right, so normally I wouldn't get a, um, 
a point of faith for a roll of a five or a six. But because of my skill of devotion, I do. So I'm up to four points of faith. Okay, so now we're in the exploration phase. Let's see what we have here. A sacrificial room. Place a treasure token on the room. All right, let me find the sacrificial room here. Let's see. There we go. Going to place our exit. Slide that in there. Place our door. And we're going to move the darkness up one to another blank space. Okay, but now we have the event phase. And we are on a tile that has an event card. So now we need to resolve this card. Collapse. Uh oh. <laughs> I recognize this. All right, you feel a rumble. Several rocky fragments land around your feet. The ceiling is about to collapse. All occurs within this map tile and the adjacent archways at the end of the next round will be permanently killed. A curse within this map tile no longer suffer uh, threatened areas. Threatened areas are all adjacent spots surrounding an enemy you can't move out of unless you tumble. Roll a d6. The result is the number of rounds the accursed must use to clear the map tile. An accursed in an adjacent square to the room's archway may spend both their move and attack face to reduce the number by one. When this number reaches zero, remove this card and its effects. So all accursed within this map tile and the adjacent hallways. All right, so, or archways. So basically I'm gonna be able to get out of this, um, this turn. Not that big of a deal. Luckily, and we don't, it actually says we don't actually seal anything off. So not so bad, not as bad as the Warhammer, uh, Warhammer quest cave in. Okay, so that was the event. And now we have our turns. So let's see here, um, I can move four. So I'm gonna go one, two, three, four. I can move again. I will go one, two, open the door. No enemies so far. Just like a good old Warhammer quest, right? All right, darkness roll. There's my one. All right, wizard rolls a one in the power phase. Put that there. So this is going to trigger this. So now we're gonna roll a die and see what kind of encounter we have. And that is a six. That is an event. Now, because this happens um, on the for the darkness roll, it will appear in a um, in a map tile of a random accursed. We only have one accursed, so this is going to appear there. And I also forgot to put a treasure token in this room which I could have uh, searched for it last turn had I not forgotten that, but we can take care of that now. Okay, so that was the darkness rule. Exploration, we do explore because there is an open archway. And we have another corridor. So I'm going to actually place this like that and have the archway come off the side there. So that's what we're looking at now. All right, now we go on to the event phase and because we have an unexplored event here, a spiked trap. You hear a clunk as a panel opens in the wall. A metal contraption covered in spikes springs from the opening at great speed towards you. One random accursed, that is me, within this map tile must make an agility one test. All right, well, you know what? 
we're going to leave it there on a cliffhanger see what happens to our exorcist hero so a little bit of an uneventful uh first turn getting set up and everything but um yeah that's how these games go you never know what's going to happen so here is our dungeon so far so far it's been pretty linear no splitting of the deck so join me next time and let's see if the spiked trap um i guess it, there's a potential uh party wipe here with this trap we'll see what happens so all right you guys will hope you enjoyed this i hope this is giving you a little flavor of what this game is like and we will talk to you guys later bye bye